It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Ames, the keynote speaker for our 2016 English Studies Student Conference. Dr. Ames is a model teacher researcher, merging academic media scholarship and pedagogy in her many roles, and there are many. She directs the English with Teacher Certification Program, where she advises all English education majors. She also spearheads the English summer camp for high school students around the state. On top of these administrative tasks, Dr. Ames <laughs> teaches all three methods courses, composition, <coughs> literature, and the integrated language arts, and also teaches literature and popular culture courses at the graduate and undergraduate level. Dr. Ames is also an amazingly productive scholar, publishing her work in anthologies and journals on a range of topics from television study, new media, and fandom to American literature and feminist art. She has, pub she has published three book <coughs> projects, the 2016 book, How Pop Culture Shapes the Stages of a Woman's Life, From Toddlers and Tierras to Cooper's on the Prowl, and two co-edited books, Women in Language, Gender Communication Across Media, and Time in Television Narrative, Exploring 21st Century Programming. She has also published essays in anthologies focused on Grey's Anatomy, Digital Writing, Twilight, Phobias, and The Vampire Diaries, and articles in journals such as the Journal of Popular Culture and Pedagogy. We are pleased she is here today to share a taste of her recent book publication, How Pop Culture Shapes the Stages of a Woman's Life. In today's presentation, Funhouse Mirrors, Culture's Distorted Visions of Gender, Dr. Ames will discuss how both media representations and cultural training contribute to these distorted visions. Please give a warm welcome to our own Dr. Ames. Thank you, Robin, for that kind introduction. When Robin Murray says that someone's busy, that's the greatest compliment you can ever receive. You know, I don't know how she does it. Um, while I'm up here, I want to thank the English Studies Conference Committee for the honor of being the first EIU faculty keynote. Anyone who knows me, because I talk a lot, knows that the English Studies Conference is a passion project of mine, and I've been extremely proud of how we've grown it over the last few years into this two-day event. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be standing here. And while I, you can't shut me up because I'm up here, I want to thank the powers that be behind planning um, the conference, the entire committee, but specifically Dr. Fern Corey, the chair of the committee, and Diana Bellion, who did a lot of the grunt work behind the scenes. So if we could clap. And one final thank you to all of you, not just for being here, but for the faculty, for the graduate students, for the undergraduate students who organized panels, volunteered to moderate, presented papers in the morning or later today. Without you, this isn't possible, and I honestly feel like this is the capstone event for our department, and I'm proud to be EIU English when I sit on this day. So without further ado, it's not about you guys, it's about me. Um, so I am going to talk to you about this book that was just recently released last month. Um, my co-author and I are really excited about it. Um, but I'm going to give you two excerpts from the introduction and the conclusion. The introduction is a little depressing. It's about all the different messages we receive from pop culture and the detrimental effect they have. And so you don't go away, you know, wanting to jump out windows and stuff. Then I'm going to give you a taste of the conclusion, which is a little bit more light at the end of the tunnel, the ways in which we can combat those messages in the way we do. Uh, we should have time for Q&A after this before the 2 p.m. panel, so I talk fast. Popular culture as of late has painted a blissful and utopic vision of gender equality in the United States. If you believe everything you read in books and see on the screen, then we are living in a wonderland full of female success. It's the age of girl power, of Frozen, girls, the Hunger Game, the girl with the dragon tattoo, Hermione Granger, Olivia Pope, Lady Gaga, and Michelle Obama. The past decade has produced our first Speaker of the House, female Speaker of the House, and presidential elections that have found women in the spotlight as nominees for presidential and vice presidential candidates. Today, we're being told that if we want to succeed in the workforce, women just have to lean in and perhaps they don't have to lean in all that far because supposedly we've come to the end of men. 
However, surprise, surprise, this is simply not the case. Beyond the facade of gender equality lie several uncomfortable truths about the status of women, not only in the United States, but around the world. Women today are still only earning 77% of what men in comparable jobs earn, and the earning gap is even more glaring when it comes to women of color. As far as job prospects go, the landscape the pop culture paints as rich with female CEOs, government officials, surgeons, and lawyers grossly misrepresents the frequency of such high position success among women. While it's true that women make up half the job force, most are not working in the positions fictionalized in primetime lineups. The majority of women still hold jobs of engendered service areas that have traditionally been available for them for decades. And despite gaining ground in various professions, women are still more likely than men to carry most burden of most domestic tasks. They continue to be held to double standards in, in terms of gender. And the world that they are living in is not growing safer for them psychologically or physically. For example, there's a 30% chance that women will end up with an eating disorder at some point in their lives, a 35% chance that they will experience violence or sexual assault. And the statistics for both depression and suicide rates among girls and women have been increasing steadily throughout the 21st century. Simply put, the cultural conditions are not the same for both genders. For example, when Nancy Pelosi became the first female Speaker of the House in 2006, the only magazine to feature her on the cover was Ms. Magazine, a point they made sure to highlight in 2011 by featuring her again with the byline, the woman Time and Newsweek won't put on their magazines. And this was shortly after those magazines put lots of pictures of John Boehner, front smad dab in the middle of their publications. Similarly, the media coverage concerning presidential hopeful Hillary Clinton and vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin during the 2008 and 2016 elections have been extremely problematic and point to the ways in which men and women are treated differently in professional careers. And if we were confused about whether girls continue to face unreachable beauty standards and overt sexual objectification, we only need to flip through a sampling of reality TV shows or watch Miley Cyrus twerking or dancing with a foam finger or sailing through the air on a wrecking ball to realize that this is still an epidemic. Feminist media critics have spent a long time analyzing such problematic imagery. However, some have now turned to studying the ways that the imagery of the uber-successful female might be equally problematic. Today, the media illusion is that equality for girls and women have been accomplished, when, of course, it hasn't. As a result, today's contradictory messages lead to a variety of misconceptions about the prospects for contemporary women. For example, a recent poll found that 60% of men and 50% of women believe that women no longer face any barriers when it comes to advancing in the workplace. Arguably, the endless stream of success narratives dominating pop culture, images of successful female doctors and lawyers and politicians and CIA agents and more, has contributed to this erroneous thought. That is, while these narratives are useful in offering positive images of professional women, they at the same time don't give a true picture of our contemporary moment. And by far, the biggest loser of this new mindset is the women's movement, which has been all too often framed as antiquated, outdated, successfully completed, and no longer necessary. Beyond being framed as passe, Feminism has arisen as the other bad F word, causing women to try to distance themselves from the movement, even as they are inundated by images of successful women who are arguably products of its work. In Bad Feminist, media critic Roxane Gay discusses how the caricature of feminists as angry, man-hating, sex-hating victims has been fostered by the people who fear feminism the most, the ones who have the most to lose when feminism succeeds. That women are buying into the fact that feminism is a cultural evil is not new, and its evidence is in pop culture that dates decades before the onset of the 21st century. However, this current moment is a bit scarier than previous ones, because the messages integrated into TV shows, films, popular literature are becoming increasingly didactic, either overtly or covertly. In the midst of a moment that has trained us that we're all selves in need of help, 
Now it's not just the medical experts and pseudo-psychiatrists who aim to show us the way to salvation. Now they are trying to fix our relationship woes and other problems, one paperback purchase at a time. Popular culture now subtly promises to, ail, promises to fix all that ails women. How to win the man, how to raise the kid, how to keep our sex appeal as we age. We only need look as far as the latest Hollywood film or reality TV show to discover the magical solution and prescriptive steps to getting the life that we want. It's important that we consider how this indoctrination into the self-help culture has impacted us and the text that we consume. You don't have to be a pop culture scholar to see that we've created a slew of stereotypical roles for women and girls, willingly or not, to play throughout their lives. The princess, the nymphette, the diva, the single girl, the tiger mother, the milf, the cougar, and more. This presentation questions the impact that pop culture has on women and girls throughout the various stages and ages of their lives. As a young girl, an adolescent, a single dating girl, a woman, a bride, a wife, a pregnant woman, a mother, a middle-aged aging woman. By studying a variety of products from childhood toys and fairy tales to popular television, Hollywood films, and self-help books, I argue that pop culture exists as a type of funhouse mirror, constantly distorting the real-world conditions that exist for women and girls and magnifying the gendered expectations that they face. Such warped depictions of women's experiences are further complicated by the fact that the vast majority of products marketed toward girls and women ignore class, race, and sexual orientation, equating female experience, in most cases, to that of a uniform middle to upper middle class white heterosexual experience. If women are perpetually trapped in this funhouse mirror through the constant barrage of media they are exposed to, how can they ever see past the blurry image of reality that they are being given? When you look at the messages that girls and women receive across their lifetime, the accumulating effect is eye-opening. For example, the toys and narratives marketed to girls highlight our culture's continued focus on girls' passive behavior, beauty, and sexuality. The complicated messages that girls receive as they are indoctrinated into girl culture have a lasting impact and stage the rest of their media development. The cultural training girls receive as children resurfaces in texts marketed to teens. By studying the most popular young adult series of the past decade, one can note the mixed messages that teenage girls receive concerning their bodies, their intellect, their autonomy, and more. Even the books praised for creating strong female protagonists, for example, Susan, Hunger, Susan Collins' The Hunger Games, Veronica Ross' uh, The Divergent series, even they contain the same problematic lessons aimed to enforce gender norms. For example, plots focus on romance, female characters who must perform femininity in order to succeed. And other popular series, such as Stephanie Meyer's Twilight Saga, reveal how female sexuality is paradoxically presented in texts aimed at adolescent girls. That is, girls are expected to be attracted to men, but not act on that attraction. These conflicting lessons girls learn during this formative stage affect them as they head into the young adult years, where serious romantic partnerships are often a major life focus. These messages find their way into a slew of how-to texts that then impact women's expectations for romantic relationships. Take, for example, the Hollywood film genre most often marketed toward women, the romantic comedy, and the ways in which it borrows, obviously or not, from the self-help arena to endorse certain behavior. What we may think of as harmless, lowbrow fluff films quickly reveal themselves as tools to instruct women on how to behave on the dating market. And what comes after dating, of course? Marriage. Popular culture establishes weddings as the so-called climactic moment of a woman's life. Training girls and young women in their earlier stages trains women to buy into such notions conserving this life event. There is an entire industry of wedding-related products that instruct audiences, largely comprised of women, on how to get married. By casting women into the role of the caretaker of weddings and associating her with household items, these narratives lay the foundation for expectations that women will be, by extensions, caretakers for the marriage, the home, and the family. Even in an era where women are delaying marriage and foregoing their spouses' names, cultural texts still spend an inordinate amount of time training women on how to be a proper missus and then later a perfect mom. 
pregnant women supposedly glow during their nine months of expected motherhood, but perhaps what we're actually noticing is the fear radiating off of their bodies, caused by all the lessons that they received during this stage of their lives. And do note the middle slide there. Um, pregnancy how-to and self-help books often utilize fear to control women during their pregnancies and beyond. Of course, the strategic rhetoric of fear concerning motherhood does not limit itself to narratives concerning pregnancy alone. Cultural products instruct women to become all-knowing, all-powerful forces in their children's lives. For example, educational experts to oversee their schooling, product safety specialists to ensure their well-being, pseudo-medical professionals to guarantee their health, and so forth. There have been a wave of mom-crafted texts that have attempted to counter this one-size-fits-all set of parenting. Take, for example, the various mom blogs and mother-written comedic books that have come to popularity, such as Stephanie Wilder Thomas's Sippy Cups Are Not for Chardonnay, Ann Dunwald's Even June Cleaver Would Forget the Juice Box, Muffy Mead Farrow's Confessions of a Slacker Mom, Christy Meller's The Three Martini Playdate, and Trisha Ashford and Amy Nobles. I was a really good mom until I had kids. These contemporary texts are redefining motherhood and connecting women and their experiences in novel ways. Unfortunately, despite their positive intentions, these texts sometimes fall prey to the same problematic lessons put in expert crafted texts that came before them. The messages that women receive as they enter into their middle and late stages of life in which their identities may not be as tied to their roles as mothers and wives are also telling. Turning once again to the depiction of women's bodies, the new sexualized terminology that has arisen in the 21st century to categorize women according to their age and sex appeal is quite telling. Although these terms are often formed with humorous intent, their staying power and use in culture, um, in, in their staying power and use as cultural descriptive categories are both intriguing and disturbing. Also troubling is the fact that the majority of these new terms, such as Puma, a 30-year-old something female, dating a younger male, cougar, a 40-year-old something, dating a younger male, and milf, mother I'd like to fuck, are restricted to the female gender alone. The use of these terms in mainstream culture do suggest that they're used in various ways. They may help to reconceptualize gender in empowering ways or in very problematic ways. This particular study of ours closes without the journey through the stages of a woman's life by turning to the messages that women receive in their so-called twilight years. There have been a recent explosion in books and other media relating to the aging woman, and in particular to menopause. Previously, menopause was a taboo word, a word that implied that the menopausal woman was now a sexless being. Hence, not only were there few books devoted to the subject, but the subject was not even broached in public spaces. Texts such as Jeremiah Greer's groundbreaking The Change, Women Aging and the Menopause, and films and theatrical productions like Something's Gotta Give, Hope Springs, and Menopause the Musical, all speak to the notion that menopause is now an accepted topic of conversation. Given this revolutionary change in viewing the formerly sexless body of the aging female as now one today that is full of life, one could argue that cultural depictions of the aging woman point to a new perception of aging and menopause as a time in a woman's life where she is now, thankfully, still able to be seen as sexually attractive. These new portrayals of older women problematize the past depictions of the aging woman and suggest that in later stages of a woman's life, popular culture training may actually be producing some positive results. What becomes clear by dividing this vast array of gendered imagery into these prescriptive stages of a woman's life is that the instruction that women receive at one stage of life carries over and influences behavior during the next. For example, messages about girlhood during youth impact narratives about dating behavior in the next stage. Um, female dating behavior carries over into that of brides and that into pregnant women and new mothers and so forth. So it's not just that popular culture is providing these depictions at nauseam at every stage of a woman's life, providing problematic depictions that range from toddlers and tiaras to cougars on the prowl. It's the spiral effect of this cultural training that needs to be noted. The little girl who overdoses on princess culture grows up easily to buy into the cultural mindset that all women should long to be a cult princess for a day. Therefore, she is easily trapped into the consumerist trappings of wedding culture. The woman who is fed prescriptive fear-mongering self-help books while pregnant 
turns easily years later to books about how to be the perfect helicopter parent by reading up on how to play the heavy or become the tiger mother. With the help of popular culture, our little brats become grown up bridezillas and our young nymphettes become middle-aged cougars. And is it really any surprise? Ultimately, I argue that the effect of these cultural narratives compounds over time like layers of scar tissue. And if we do not engage with these cultural narratives critically. In the end, I suggest that not all is lost and these scars can fade. The ways in which people can and do counter these narratives are plentiful. Formal and informal media literacy efforts are growing and can definitely help 21st century women resist these gender dictates. However, what would help is if we had even fewer gendered messages to thwart in the first place. Some companies have taken action on their own accord in attempts to work toward this goal. For example, one of the most talked about Super Bowl 2014 commercials was launched by the company Always, feminine product, they sell feminine products. Um, the video began with this question, what does it mean to do something like a girl? Then young women and men were asked to demonstrate doing things like a girl. They ran like a girl, they punched like a girl, they threw a ball like a girl. All the participants performed these actions in a similar fashion. They flailed their arms, smiled foolishly as they ran, they moved their legs ineffectually. But when younger girls were asked to do the same things like a girl, they gave it their best shot. They ran with determination, they punched with force, they threw a ball with gusto. The video pauses to project the question, when did doing something like a girl become an insult? This video demonstrates not only the negative stereotypes concerning female strength and skill, but also reveals how deeply entrenched these stereotypes are within the general population. The young girls who attempted each action to the best of their ability, even when requests were framed to be done like a girl, are proof that girls are not born as self-effacing beings, but rather slowly grow to accept negative gendered stereotypes over time. The video continued on to interview girls, noting that the phrase, like a girl, is humiliating. And the text screen appears noting, a girl's self-confidence plummets during puberty. The following screenshot arrives and with the company's self-promotion, always wants to change that. This video is, of course, a public relations product meant to foster positive feelings for a company that profits off of products sold to young women beginning in puberty. However, despite their self-serving motives, the video had an incredibly positive message and initiated the like a girl hashtag trend on Twitter. Suddenly, feeds were filled with pictures of girls and women around the world doing all sorts of positive acts, all accompanied by the popular hashtag. For example, one young woman posted an impressive photo of her prize-winning jump, high jump, with the statement, I'm proud of jumping like a girl. And another woman posted pictures of herself in her army fatigue, saying, I serve my country like a girl. Despite the widespread positive Twitter campaign, the public service video didn't escape a wrath of online criticism as well. Immediately after the video aired, meninists yeah, meninist as opposed to feminist. Meninists urge people to get the hashtag like a boy trending on um, Twitter. And so suddenly we saw posts like, like a boy because equality matters. So the activity surrounding the Always campaign clearly shows that gender equality is far from reached and that many more messages like this one are needed for those to change consumer products. Yet another video that operates in a similar way to the Like a Girl was a commercial produced by Similac, one of the largest baby formula companies. This two and a half minute video titled The Sisterhood of Motherhood first aired on January 17, 2015. Meant to tackle a serious subject with a humorous tone, Similac purportedly released this video as a way to encourage moms to accept one another and their own particular style of parenting. It opens with a mom, baby strapped to her chest, sitting down at a park bench. She looks around, seeming frightened, as several stroller-pushing moms with grim looks approach the park in a scene that is reminiscent of rival gangs appearing for a confrontation. We see more babies in strollers, their moms in power suits, clutching their phones and briefcases. Then we see stay-at-home dads, followed by yoga moms and stay-at-home breastfeeding moms, as the park quickly fills up with every cliched parenting type you can imagine. Then the quips begin. Oh look, the breast police have arrived, says one woman. 
Helicopter mom, 12 o'clock, mutters one dad. The judgmental comments continue and escalate. Oh, disposable diaper? Well, we apparently don't care about the environment. I wonder what it's like to be a part-time mom. Ugh, stay-at-home moms, I wonder what they do all day. The final argument in the video, not unimportantly, stems from a comment that it's not all about the breast, and the entire group of warring parents is ready for a brawl when a stroller begins to roll down the hill with a young child in it. United by a shared concern, the diverse range of parents all race down the hill and rescue the baby just in time. It's worth noting that, of course, it is one of the stay-at-home dads who rescues the baby. Yeah. So, This text then appears across the screen. No matter what our beliefs, we are parents first. Welcome to the sisterhood of motherhood, Similac. Sisterhood, unite. So like the company always, Similac has a vested interest in producing such an ad because the breast versus bottle controversy isn't good for their company. However, the message contained within this strategic public relations piece is a good one. There is no one right way to parent. More famous than these two ads is likely the Dove's 2004 real campaign for real beauty, which featured real women of various sizes on billboards and magazines across the country. The ad campaign, like the video, although beneficial to female viewers, was not likely an altruistic act on the part of the company either, because within a year of Dove's campaign, sales rose 12.5% and then another 10% the following year. Some critics have resisted celebrating this positive campaign on the basis that Dove's parent company, Unilever, also owns companies like SlimFast, a diet supplement company, Axe, selling men's body spray, and Fair and Lovely, skin whitening cream companies that do not align with their real beauty message. Although these companies may benefit from their feminist campaigns, the media landscape would be a much healthier place for women and girls if all companies embraced this means of increasing their bottom lines. And it's not just educational people and industry leaders who are paving the way for a better tomorrow. Recently, numerous celebrities have shrugged off the stigma that can accompany labeling oneself as a feminist and have embraced the term. Of course, the media being media, has re this has resulted in debates over whose brand of feminism is better, pitting one woman against the other. For example, following Emma Watson's United Nations speech concerning the He for She campaign, Watson was immediately compared to pop singer Beyonce. Beyonce had recently performed at the 2014 MTV Video Music Awards in front of a large, glowing, capitalized word, feminist. Since forced female competition is a societal norm, these two celebrities were pitted against one another, with the public chiming in on who was the better feminist, who deserved to be called a feminist. Sadly, this shows oftentimes celebrities who want to embrace and claim the term are punished for their efforts to do so. Despite this potential, celebrities, male and female alike, continue to use their various platforms to work toward gender equality. For example, during her impassioned 2015 Oscar acceptance speech for leading actress, Patricia Arquette addressed wage inequality between men and women. There are also movements underfoot in Hollywood that aim to make it a more feminist-friendly, or at least women-friendly, industry. The Women's Media Center is raising awareness and funds to help address the crisis of representation in the media. Female celebrities have been collaborating in various ventures to draw attention to the rampant sexism in Hollywood. One example is the Make It Fair campaign, which calls attention to gender equality in the stories we tell, the wages we earn, and the futures we shape. Much of the feminist work being done today is actually started online. Quote, a new wave of feminism is here, and its most powerful weapon is the hashtag, end quote, writes MSNBC social media manager Nisha Chattel. Some examples of the feminist work that have been happening through Twitter include grassroots campaigns to draw attention to violence and harassment women face, such as the Yes All Women movement, which provided a forum for women to discuss instances of harassment and discrimination, the hashtag not guilty and rape is win and survivor privilege, which were all hashtags used to discuss victim blaming and rape cases. While these, are primarily, while these examples primarily focus on making the world physically safer for women, there are other online movements focusing in on making it psychologically safer for women. One of these examples is the not buying it hashtag that women employed during the Super Bowl 2013 season for the first time. This was meant to rally against sexist ads and encourage consumers not to pro purchase products with misogynistic marketing. 
A similar instance of digital activism unfolded when thousands of people protested Victoria's Secret's perfect body slogan and it caused the multi-billion dollar company to change its slogan to a body for everybody. If there are troubling messages directed to women at every stage of their lives, the good news is there seems to be a social media campaign aimed to challenge them at every stage as well. One campaign focused specifically on young girls revolves around the hashtag girls with toys, which materialized to continue the conversation about the lack of women in STEM fields. An assistant professor at University of Illinois began this campaign after hearing a Caltech professor refer to scientists as boys with toys on NPR, a statement which sheds light on why there are so many few women entering STEM fields. Consumers quickly turned to review boards to criticize the Barbie book titled, I Can Be a Computer Engineer, which despite its title, ultimately reinforces the notion that girls aren't cut out for STEM fields. After Barbie breaks every computer she touches, she has to enlist in a male friend to help her fix everything so she can finish designing, not programming, the game she claimed to be making. At the very beginning of the book, Barbie makes it clear to readers she isn't really going to be a computer engineer when she says to her sister Skipper, I'm only creating the design idea. I'll need Steven and Brian to help turn it into a real game. The children's book and the criticism of it went viral. During this time, people eagerly left negative reviews on Amazon.com, with one reviewer calling it possibly the most irresponsible children's book ever created. Similarly, consumer activism has been surrounding text aimed at adolescent girls. Consider the incredibly horrific and slightly ironic CoverGirl makeup line inspired by The Hunger Games. Many fans of the shows were bothered by this marketing campaign, and they went online to show it. To challenge CoverGirl's inappropriate advertisements, some teens posted accurate capital-themed selfies and captions on Tumblr to represent the true spirit of the Hunger Game makeovers. One such caption read, With my new CoverGirl body art pen, I drew a map of the Hunger Games playing field on my face. This heart represents where my favorite tribute, Clove, got killed right by the cornucopia. I bet a lot of money on her. I was really hoping that she'd kill that Katniss girls. Ugh, District 12 tributes are always just so poor. Years ago, a teen might have found the cover girl advertising problematic and unsettling, but wouldn't have had a means to speak out against it. But today, more than ever before, those without a voice can now be heard. Another previously vo voiceless community that is now turning quite vocal thanks to the internet is mothers. Two recent successful photo campaigns led by moms deal with the sexualization of women and the existing double standards related to beauty. The first campaign was connected to the long-standing tradition of sexualizing Halloween costumes, particularly Halloween costumes aimed at women and girls. Everyone expected 2014 to feature plenty of Frozen costumes, but many were especially shocked when some of those costumes were sexualized and marketed to younger women. Some of the ads for these costumes featured 20-something female models posing coquettishly as Anna or Elsa, showcasing an excessive amount of flesh, and an even crazier costume showing a young woman posing in, wait for it, a sexy Olaf costume. <laughs> because yes, a sexy snowman costume, because any costume can be sexy if aimed for a woman to wear. In response to this, Suzanne Fleet, author of the mommy blog Toulouse and Tonic, teamed up with fellow female writers to create a set of parody pictures titled Sexy Halloween Costumes for Moms. These included photos with the caption, Drive You Crazy Carpool Mom, <laughs> Fifty Shades of Laundry, and the luscious lactator. <laughs> the second mom launch campaign, hashtag MomBod, was in response to the birth of the new term DadBod. On March 30th, 2015, Mackenzie Pearson, a college sophomore at Clemson University, coined the term through an online post titled, Why Girls Love the Dad Bod. Pearson defined the dad bod as a nice balance between a beer gut and working out claiming that the dad bod sends the message, I go to the gym occasionally, but I also drink heavily on the weekends and enjoy eating eight slices of pizza at a time. She clarifies that the dad bod isn't an overweight guy, but it isn't one with ash, uh, washboard abs either. 
Well, the term isn't restricted for use for actual dads. In fact, Pearson meant it as a description for the common frat boy on college campuses. The takeaway is still the same. Men are accepted for the ways in which their bodies change, be it due to age or other factors, but women are not. One critic observes, no one is writing articles why men love the mom bod because our society praises women who are MILFs. Women quickly took to the internet to ridicule the praise over the dad bod. For example, comedian Akila Hughes released a satirical video titled, Move Over Dad Bod, Mom Bod is the New Hot Bod, which addresses the double gendered standards addressing women's and men's bodies. Non-celebrity women began posting photos of their imperfect bodies to Twitter with the hashtag MomBod. Women proudly posted shots of their abdomens adorned with stretch marks or C-section scars and included posts like, my body wasn't perfect to begin with and it isn't perfect now, or this is my mom bod, I carried life, or celebrating the dad bod is an insult to mothers. Cyberspace has also been a place for women to draw attention to their concerns about cultural ageism. For example, the hashtag older women voices arose to give concern to those who fear that they will re lose their careers due to aging. And celebrities have used it to attend to the ways that sexism and ageism is aligned in the entertainment industry. In the UK, four British soap actresses posed naked on the front of Best Magazine to raise awareness to the concern of age discrimination on TV. In the US, four American actresses produced a comedy skit for Inside Amy Schumer titled The Last Fuckable Day, which highlighted the gendered double standards concerning sex appeal in Hollywood. And recently, bloggers took to the web to debate the negative media coverage when 56-year-old Madonna kissed 28-year-old singer Drake on stage at a music festival, coverage that again reveals the discomfort the society feels when confronted with imagery of the overly sec sexually active aging woman. All the messages that these various women are protesting against often tie back to the post-feminist fairy tale promoted by the media the myth that we are currently living in a physically and emotionally safe world where gender equality has been reached. While not all of the problem, problems facing contemporary women can be blamed on the media, this exploration of cultural texts does reveal that the media must shoulder some responsibility. But even when troubling imagery overloads the media landscape, we have to be careful to not assume that its presence is part of some diabolical plan to put women in their place. As Susan Douglas remarks, there is not a cabal of six white guys in Hollywood saying, women are getting too much power. Before they get too far, let's buy them off with fantasies and make them think they've made it already and let them focus on shopping and breast pants instead of eyeing that glass ceiling. She continues, so while the media are hardly hypodermic needles injecting a passive and unsuspecting culture um, with po powerful alien images and messages that we all say yes to, they do play a potent role in shaping our identities, our dreams, our hopes, our ambitions, and our fears. So shaking our fists at the media powers that be, in short, is less than productive. Since popular culture will continue to be a dominant force in the gendered socialization of women at all stages of their lives, it is instead much more fruitful to find ways to work within the system and train the young and old, male and female, alike on how to read through the complicated and contradictory messages that work to instruct them on who they're supposed to be. There are many ways to combat the messages we experience at each age. We can choose to use the media to challenge the media. If we believe that social media democratized feminist activism, opening up participation to anyone with a Twitter account and a desire to fight patriarchy, then it is just one more tool for our toolbox. We can also challenge these new messages the same way women have done in the past, marching, sending letters to Congress, or collecting signatures on handwritten petitions. If we critically engage and resist all of these conflicting messages that we are confronted with at every stage of our lives, striking out against the funhouse mirror every time such distorted imagery comes our way, eventually we will make a difference. Small blows can add up, mirrors can shatter, and eventually perhaps we can walk over those broken shards and exit the funhouse once and for all. Thank you. So I think we have time for questions.
despair of all late night comics, and it was all men. And she has tweeted a picture of herself as a center with blazing eyes, uh, and, and right in the middle of the pack. But she had to insert herself there. But um, I, I think, yeah, it's being what you're saying, addressing these absences and also the impositions of certain images. Yeah, that reminds me of the image you might have seen floating around on Facebook of if you Photoshop all men uh, from the Senate or the House or the Congress or any political room out and you have like these three women, you know, that all you can see. So any, any we name a location or a space and we talk about gender imbalance and it's going to be there more glaring than we think because all these images kind of show us a different reality than we're living in, for sure. Talk about it. You, you talk about TV shows that that sort of idolize women and sort of create this this false sense of, of female success. And you talk about a lot of reality TV shows that 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 pay a, a bad objectify women. But I'm wondering if there's sort of something in the middle, something that you feel like is responsible for training women, and if not, what that would look like. The problem is, I, I think I'm always on this quest for the uber perfect feminist text I can put on a pedestal, and the minute I launch it up there, I just end up knocking it down again. So what I see with texts that start off is really powerful. Uh, Shonda Rhimes has a lot. You know, I, I'm really impressed with what she does in terms of diversity and gender representation. But then I find the problems that sneak into all cultural texts. So for example, Olivia Pope, uh, Scandal. You know, she was hailed as someone that could be a great role model, and the sexualized romantic storyline really undercut her over the last few years. I was really excited when How to um, Get Away with Murder launched and I thought, oh, this is going to be fabulous. We have a strong um, African-American female character portrayed in this great role and she was portrayed in the first episode as performing sexual favors to win her case. And so every time I see a really strong female character, it seems that at least one uh, common pop culture trope knocks it down a few pegs. And so I'm still on that search. And so I think we have to celebrate the good parts even while noticing these kind of problematic messages that we can't thwart. Um, I started by studying soap operas. Uh, and those obviously have some problem, but they were great feminist tools. They were a space where women's issues were worked out decades before they dared to be reached in prime time. But even then, they, they reinforce certain gender norms. So. I think it's because of writing. So I mean, you can see this in the publishing industry as well. You know, certain things sell, um, certain genres get hot, certain kind of motifs. The YA genre, for example, there is a reason why they almost all follow the same pattern of the young adult, you know, love triangle, and and we want certain things or or writers or producers think we want certain things, and the trend just per perpetuates, is what I think. So. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, that, you know, what, what sort of really diverse books people are doing right now is figuring out and saying, like, let's do a survey of publishers. Who works there? Are they going to recognize this kind of text when it comes to or are they going to make it before something else? Or, you know, we assume, you know, covers with black faces don't, you know, don't sell the same way, but that's completely an assumption from mm -hmm. a group of people who have not been able to see a CD, you know, in their lives or something like that. that so, you know, I mean, in terms, you know, it just, it makes me tired to think about always having to push back because the people handing it out are the same. Well, and I think the good thing about this this media moment that we're living in is, you know, we're not living in the, the three-station network era anymore. At our disposal, we have Hulu and Amazon and Netflix all producing all of these imagery that I think it's going to be, it's going to change quicker in our lifetime than it has in years past because there is so much more opportunity to get text and different text. And we talk back a lot more to media than we ever had before. And they listen. So if you don't like something, everyone, get on live, live tweet about it. They're changing problematic stories and characters almost immediately. So we really do have a voice and then our chance to make our own media, right? We can get on and create counter narratives and fanfic that tell it the way we want to tell it, that do represent those who don't get representation. So I do think that is slowly um, filtering in and changing our text. But, you know, Shonda Rhimes said it best when she got an award for doing what she does. And she said, you are giving me an award for recognizing the world as I see it. That shouldn't be award worthy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you 
heard about the recent controversy regarding um, tampons being considered a luxury. Yep. Item. Mm -hmm. Tax. Um, so, and like trying to admit uh, taxes from tampon products. Mm -hmm. um, so, I was just wondering, like, how your reaction to that and having it being seen as a luxury. Mm -hmm. It's part of a whole consumeristic thing. Um, there's something called the pink tax, and that's not literally a tax, but if you look at a razor sold to a woman that is pink, the same Bic razor sold to a man, the woman's razor is more expensive, the woman's deodorant is more expensive, same products. And so women for a long time have been doling out a lot more money for necessary items. And so when I first heard of the tampon tax, I went, but of course, right? I mean, and these are the things we should be fighting against because it's more expensive to actually just be a woman um, for lots of reasons and yet then there's the wage inequality that you put on top of that and then you can see why the playing field never le levels out. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna try to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> so um, we're t you were talking about before you brought up like the Hunger Games and, Kat and Katniss and um, a lot of why dystopia texts to me like they try to portray these strong heroines but they do so by kind of emasculating them in a way. And um, I just wondered if you had an idea on that, if you think that that's wrong, like if we're trying to, I don't know, like can there be a strong female heroine in pop culture that's also feminine? Yeah, so that's my entire chapter two. Uh, I've written a lot on YA. So, uh, you know, I loved The Hunger Games when it came out. I adored, you know, I, I kind of really loved Katniss, and it took me a long time to realize those problematic things. And I read this great uh, article by Noah Berlansky in The Atlantic, and it was Katniss versus Bella. Google it. It's wonderful. And they talked about how we all want to rip on Bella and put Katniss on a pedestal. And he reframes it in all these interesting ways, the ways in which we're really showing our valuing of masculinity versus feminine when we want to complain about Bella being passive and when the, some of the things she does and praising Katniss. And so he frames it in lots of different questions. He talks about the ends of both those books where Bella actually grows stronger and saves her family, whereas uh, you know Katniss ends in a kind of domesticated, abusive relationship that's you know pretty, pretty heartbreaking. Um, and this idea that people talk about the Twilight Saga, rightfully so, as being extremely pro-life, but people say, you know, you can embrace it as pro-choice too, and it's not a bad thing that she chose to carry the life to term, and do we, would we rather have a daughter who kills 12 people in cold blood murder or one that shows life? And so there's so many interesting ways to flip the way I was reading those that I, I do think it's worth considering. And then same thing with the characters that are over-masculinized, they also get punished um, for being so. I mean, both the diverse series and the Hunger Games series end pretty po negatively. Like, okay, you could succeed and be different and slap. This is what happened to you. Well, on the same vein, uh, there was a cartoon in the 90s, Johnny Bravo, mm -hmm. and uh, he was seen as this overly masculine person and he would objectify and then every single time he would, he, he would get punished for it. For over, over masculine or over? Uh, he would be like, he would try to hit on women and would be oh. like, very, very weird about it, mm -hmm. and so they they show this is how you this isn't show how you should treat people. Good, and then, you know I'm not saying that no text out there is is doing some of that for us, but it's just we need more of it, right? I mean that that would be a nice counter message to be receiving. Yeah. Kind of going off of that, I thought um, you could show that did a good job of showing a, a character that was very strong but stayed simple with love for the vampires. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's not perfect, but I thought it was very interesting that they made it real that she was very trendy and he had been like all that, but she still knew what she had to do. But the question I want to ask that has to do with that is that, <laughs> is that true that they tried banning the word feminism? Yep. Well, it was just uh, Time said, what words should we get rid of? And Time Magazine let feminism be on the list, and they got, they got a lot of blowback. So it didn't happen, and they had to apologize the next issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes? You talked about a lot about like, sex, how was it all this stuff? Was it harder for you to... Like, get your book published since you are actually like, learning all of this stuff? No, what's harder is I'm, I'm publishing, I'm trying to publish as a crossover academic, so, you know, some of the books that I've written in the past have been high theory and academic and meant for only probably, you know, professorly types, and now I'm getting more interested in, in writing books that my mom can read, that anyone, any woman, any man can read, because I think the message is so important. And so this is an interesting book in that it's right smack dab in the middle, which makes markets harder. So my next book, I want to say bye-bye academics, I don't care about writing for you anymore. And I'm going to write all the way for mainstream, and, and hopefully it'll be easier. But, um, 
Um, no, subject matter, there's so much good stuff being written about gender and pop culture right now. So, I mean, you could, you could read forever and ever and ever and, and never finish, so. Um, about a year and a half ago, I read this play called The Heidi Chronicles by Wendy Wasserstein. And um, it's really heartbreaking because it shows this movement of women in the 1960s during the, the, the rise of the feminist movement. And they push really hard to fight for women's rights. And then when they have children of their own who are able to um, actually get jobs in the workforce, uh, they kind of look down at the women who worked very hard for them. And so do you think that maybe one of the reasons that uh, the word feminist is kind of getting a bad rep now is because we've moved uh, several decades from the initial women's right movement and we sort of maybe take for granted all the things they worked hard for? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they talk about that with the various waves of feminism, where second wave feminism was, we think of feminism on the streets, and then the next generation. They didn't have to do that work, so it became a very personalized form of feminism, and that's why some, um, you know, feminists today think that, you know, feminism can be, you know, using your body to get things done. And so there's all these different camps um, who want to think feminism should be one way or the other. Um, and yeah, I just think that there's a lot of fear of the word. I think that we, we set women up to be punished when they say it, you know, um, people react to it in a certain way. And so it's going to take a reclaiming and a re-understanding of what it is to kind of weed that out of our culture. I mean, so hopefully it'll be your generation that does that. Now, do you happen to, <clears throat> in your work, bring up some of the ways in which we can combat that first uh, wave that begins in childhood? Um, what are some of the ways and things that we can do with our children at that point that will try and stop some of those following waves from occurring? That's a great question. So this book was really personal to me because as I wrote it, I went through all the stages of my life. Um, you know, I'll start with a kind of embarrassing story. So the reason why we started this book was because we were interested in the terms MILF, Cougar, and Puma. And it started because my colleague and I were having um, drinks and over wine. That's what we did. All good writing starts over drinks, right? And she said, oh my goodness, I heard this term MILF the other day and you'll never believe what it means. And as she's telling me and getting more and more angry, I started to giggle. No, no one judged me. And then she's like, what is it? I'm like, well, I always wanted to grow up kind of and be a MILF. And I was sort of joking, and I was sort of not, and I wasn't a mom yet. And so after we were done joking and choking on our wine, we had this really academic conversation about why we reacted to these terms differently. Was it because she was a mom I wasn't at that point in time? Was it because there was 13 years that separated us, and I was um, in college when American Pie and Stifler's mom came out? So I just grew up with the term as a punchline. And so that's when this product started, and we actually wanted to interview people. And so throughout writing this book, it started there. I was pregnant while I was writing my pregnancy chapter, and I'm raising girls, and so I'm thinking all the time about how to combat those messages. And so some of the scholars that I love talk about talking back at the media, and they don't mean literally just doing the things I'm saying on social media, but literally having conversations um, with the people we watch media with, our best friends, our family members, and so actually having a dialogue. There was one author, one scholar, who said she used to watch soaps with her teenagers so she could talk about sex. It was the easiest way to have those conversations about romantic relationships and sex and, and say it. I've tweeted before, I hope my girls are, or the, the bachelorette is still around when my girls are, are teenagers, so I can sit and say all the things I don't want them to be doing. And so I think that, you know, having those dialogue is really good. And just knowing that it's always been this way. Um, texts have been training us for years. There was an image of the breastfeeding baby doll that came out in two, the early 2000s. This is no different than what happened during Teddy Roosevelt's era, where they first launched the baby doll and fake brooms and ovens and stuff for little kids. They were trying to train um, white girls to have babies again because it was the eugenics movements and they were afraid of declining birth rates. So culture is always using texts for children, you know, morality stories, our fairy tales. So I think we just, we just talk back it and talk through it and we become media critics and we train our kids to be media critics. Um, so kind of going off of that, um, I know you talk a lot about using social media as a way to talk back at popular media. But concerning young ch young women using social media, do you ever think it had it could potentially have a negative impact on developing? Young women? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the two black are going to start. Soon, so we probably should focus. Okay. Um, do you think that the young women using social media could um, have an impact on them? Yeah, because um, they suddenly have access to seeing a lot of very older women and seeing some of these things, particularly on visual platforms such as Instagram or Facebook. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've had students write about it in my, you know, my composition classes, just about how we're inundated now in a way we've never been before uh, with these kind of imagery, especially the idolization of celebrities and following the way they behave in social media. I think I'm just more in general worried about the digital footprint we're all leaving um, and the ways that that kind of missteps, whether it be gendered behavior or whatnot, is going to follow us. So yeah, I think it's all scary. It's powerful and it's it's frightening. So I'm, I'll let you guys ask me more questions, but but if you need to go to a two o'clock panel, that's okay too. Oh, it is so expensive right now that only I will only let academic libraries buy it. But once we sell 300 copies, it comes to normal person price, and you can go on Amazon.com. So by fall, everybody Google how, how pop culture shapes your life, and right now just ask EIU's library to buy it with their non-existent funds. Thank you. <laughs>